Hello everyone, this is Reverend Dr. Roger Paul, and tonight we're going to study paper 81, the modern and the development of the modern civilization. on page 900.3. That's paper 8111. <coughs> the uh, development of modern civilization, is that what you're saying? Uh-huh. What did I say? Development stage? <laughs> well, it's uh, one, and I've got paper 81. have a little prayer and we'll get started. Uh, Father, thank you for bringing us together again tonight. Uh, that we might study this wonderful revelation. Uh, we thank you for the ability to do this online. Sometimes it's technically hard, but we somehow keep working it out. We thank you for your patience with us, both in our hearts and minds, that we might learn something in and share it with others. We thank you and we give you the praise in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, the development of modern civilization. Um, Millie, would you like to start us out tonight? I'll do that. Paper eight looks up the paper eight one developed a modern civilization. Regardless of the ups and downs of the miscarriage of plans for world betterment projected in the missions of Caligastia and Adam, the basic organic evolution of the human species continued to carry the races forward in the scale of human progress and racial development. Evolution can be delayed, but it cannot be stopped. So regardless of the rebellion, right, Calig the re Caligastia's involvement in the rebellion, and Adam's default, even though Adam defaulted and put us in a worse state, the basic uh, organic evolution can just stay continued on. And nothing will stop that. We'll keep uh, evolving over time, and regardless of whatever, what else happens, that's going to be the case. Uh, Rocky, would you take the next one, please? The influence, excuse me. The influence of the violent groups, though a number is smaller than have been planned, produced an advance in civilization which, since the days of Adam, has far exceeded the progress of mankind throughout its entire previous existence of almost a million years. So even though there's less of the violent blood out there than had been planned, there's still enough of it that, that pushed us forward, right? Right. One, the cradle of civilization. For about 35,000 years after the days of Adam, the cradle of civilization was in southwestern Asia, extending from the Nile Valley eastward and slightly to the north across northern Arabia through Mesopotamia and on, to, and on into Turkestan. And climate was a decisive factor in the establishment of civilization in that area. And while they're talking about climate, they're talking about the rains, right? The flooding, uh, the glacier movement above, you know, in Eurasia. And, and all these things affected where civilization started to come. It was the great climatic and geologic changes in northern Africa and western Asia that terminated the early migration of the Adamites, barring them from Europe by the expanding Mediterranean and 
diverting the stream of migration north and east into Turkestan. By the time of the completion of these land elevations and associated climatic changes, about 1500 BC, 15, I mean, I'm sorry, 15,000 BC, civilization had settled down to a worldwide stalemate, except for the cultural ferments and biologic reserves of the Andites, still confined by mountains to the east in Asia and by the expanding force in Europe to the west. So these things, you know, because of the rising of the mountains and the expansion of the Mediterranean Sea and the retraction, that sort of thing, changed the way these, these people were migrating across these lands, right? So we can't change the weather, as they say. Right. Uh, Millie, can you take the next one, please? Millie? Still out there? I'm just reading away. <laughs> Climactic evolution is now about to accomplish what all other efforts have failed to do. That is, to compel Eurasian man to abandon hunting for the more advanced callings of herding and farming. Evolution may be slow, but it is terribly effective. I can't stand, you can't stop time, can you? Wait a minute. Rodney? Since the slaves were so generally employed by the colonial agriculturists, the farmer was formerly looked down on by both the hunter and the hunter. <coughs> For ragers, it was considered menial to till the soil. Wherefore, in my view, that soil toil the first, whereas it is the greatest of all blessings. Even in the days of pain and evil, the sacrifices of the pastoral life were held in greater esteem than the offerings of other people. Okay, so even in the days of Cain and Abel, remember Cain and Abel? Uh, Cain was a uh, was an agriculturalist, right? Nabal was a uh, was a herder, and uh, they even in those days, uh, the pastoral life were, were considered were, were were held higher. In other words, taking care of animals was held higher than agriculture to tilling the soil. And in reality, uh, it was the best. It was the blessing to till the soil because it brought food to people. And it's a it's a natural form of existence, right? It still is today. We still look down on farmers sometimes. Right? A man ordinarily evolved into a farmer from a hunter by transition through the era of the herder. And this was also true among the Andites. But more often the evolutionary conclusion of climatic necessity would cause whole tribes to pass directly from hunters to successful farmers. But this phenomenon of passing immediately of passing immediately from the hunting to agriculture only occurred in those regions where there was a high degree of race mixture with the violet stock. Because it was the violet stock that were were agriculturalists, right? <laughs> they learned from that. The e evolutionary peoples, notably the Chinese, early learned to plant seeds and to cult cultivate crops through observation of the sprouting of seeds accidentally moistened or which had been put in graves as food for the departed. But throughout Southwest Asia along the fertile river bottoms and the adjacent plains, the Andites were carrying out the improved agricultural techniques inherited from their ancestors who had made farming and gardening their the chief pursuit within the boundaries of the second garden. So they learned these skills from the second garden from whom? Out of need, right? Really? For thousands of years, the descendants of Adam had grown wheat and barley and improved in the garden, as improved in the garden, throughout the highlands of the upper border of Mesopotamia. The descendants of Adam and Adam's son here met, traded, and socially mingled. Right. 
Um, we skipped one, Roger. We did. On the slides. Well, on the, on the slides, which one was? That's not it either. It's right after that. That one? That one we did. It's, it starts with the word it. Maybe That's right. You're going to read that. It was. It was these enforced changes in the. I'm going to read that, but Roger oh, can't find it on the slide. That's slide Which one's seven. Which one's on now? That's six. We, we, we just finished that. Five. That's the one. That was just one. Since they suggested. Yeah, it's not in there. <laughs> I'll just read it. Uh, what what's it after? Which which right after the word mingled? After the word what? We haven't done that one yet. I read that one. Oh, oh. So, excuse yes. me, sorry. The thousands of years, the descendants. And then there's another one. Yeah, and then there's one that's good. Can we leave one out? Um, yeah, I'll just read it. Okay. Alright. It was these enforced changes in living conditions which caused such a large proportion of the human race to become omnivorous, 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 thank you, during scientific practice. And the combination of the wheat, whites, and vegetable diet with the flesh of the birds marked a great forward step in the health and vigor of these ancient people. And now we go to section two here. Okay, so it was the paragraph right before section two? Yeah. Oh, I left it out somewhere. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, that doesn't surprise me. We do make mistakes sometimes. <laughs> okay, so that makes you up here. Two. Two, the tools of civilization. The growth of culture is predicated upon the development of the tools of civilization. And the tools which man utilized in his ascent from savagery were effective just to the extent that they released man power for the accomplishment of higher tasks. So as, as men became more civilized, and they figured out how to use animals and other people to do their work, it gave, it gave them free time, right? And that gave them time to think about things and develop things. You who now live amid latter-day scenes of budding culture and beginning progress in social affairs who actually have some little spare time in which to think about society and civilization must not overlook the fact that your early ancestors had little or no leisure which could be devoted to thoughtful reflection and social thinking. That's because they work all the time, right? You know, tilling the soil and hunting and that sort of thing. Millie. The first four great advances in human civilization were, one, the taming of fire, two, the domestication of animals, three, the enslavement of captives, and four, private property. I want to mention something on this slide that me and Diane watched the other night. We watched the program in the first episode of it, it was called Origins. In the first, very first ep episode, episode uh, of it was about fire and how fire changed the world to make the world number one scientific and brought us into civilization. It was very, very well done. I, we were talking about this today, how well done it was. It, it, it mirrors the Urantia book so closely. Uh, and, and this is the list basically of what you would call origin moments, mm -hmm. okay? The taming of fire, the domestication of animals, it's through the domestication of animals provided uh, human beings with a constant food source. And then uh, the enslavement of captive, captives. What do you think that was? Captives. captives. What do you think that was important? Because the agriculturalists took slaves, they had slaves to do the work in the field which freed them up to do other things and that's helped society along. And then the fourth one, private property, by men being able to own property, put us in a situation where we could develop our own food, not just for the tribe and the, the, the area, but personally, individually for our family. So that's why these are so important uh, to human civilization. All right. 
But I recommend you watch that show if you get a chance. It's called Origins, and the very first episode is about fire and how it brought us into a technological age. It's really quite amazing. What's the name of the program? Origins. Well, the Origins, and they have after that they have different. The they have different ones. The, the the second one after that I think was about uh, uh, money exchange when men learned how to exchange money in place of uh, try to bartering things. But the name of the program is Origins of Man. It's called Just Origins. Origins. Uh, Origins. And then the, the second part is what it's really. And, and the reason they call it Origins. I still haven't gotten the name of the program. Origins. O-R-I-G-I-N-S. That's Origins. Okay. Origins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And each episode's what they feel is a, um, a specific moment or specific thing that changed the world after that forevermore. Okay, so that's why they call it Origins. It's, it's Where did you find this? What channel? It's on the History Channel. It's on History? Yeah. yeah. It almost exclusively works on the History Channel. It's just amazing the shows they're on. And they're all scientific. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, Genius has been wonderful. Oh, Genius oh, yeah, has been wonderful. Yeah, that's a good show. Yeah, so if you get a chance, uh, look it up, watch it on, on demand, and you can see the very first episode, and it's about five. Okay? Thank you. Uh-huh. Rodney, can you read the next one? Sure. Yeah. Well, fire, the first great discovery, he gets a lot of tools for the side of the field. It wasn't a little value in this regard to come to man. He received recognized natural causes as explanations to cause these phenomena. Which is interesting uh, because even though uh, Andon, of Andon and Ponta fame, uh, Andon learned how to start a fire with a flint rock, right? And that really was the beginning of our use of fire. But that story was told generation after generation and it eventually disappeared. Okay, so, and, which is interesting, the next paragraph come, come, uh, talks about. In Origins, it talked about the fire starting this and then how it evolved into uh, trade yeah. because different tribes would see another person with a fire and they would know how to do the fire and they would have something to trade and they would trade for the, the knowledge know, of how to the knowledge it. or meat that they had cultivated that they had you know, secured. Right. It's just it's wonderful the way it follows pattern of work. Yeah. When asked where the fire came from, the simple story of Andon and the Flint was soon replaced by the legend of how some Prometheus stole it from heaven. The ancients sought a supernatural explanation for all natural phenomena, not within the range of their personal comprehension. And many moderns continue to do this. The depersonalization of so-called natural phenomena has required ages, and it is not yet completed. But the frank, honest, and fearless search for the true causes gave birth to modern science. It turned astrology into astronomy, alchemy into chemistry, and magic into medicine. And that was another one they did on Origin was the medicine, which yeah, is amazing to watch the progress and the evolution too. of it. Yeah. 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 We've, we learned an interesting fact on the one on medicine that uh, Nostradamus was actually a, uh, um, like a doctor during the play, <coughs> Black Death, and he's not known for that. But he was like a, uh, he went around and had, help mark houses and collect bodies and that sort of thing. And he helped them wash, learn to, to you know, wash, wash their hands, hands and how to, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Added a whole other dimension to his, his work, to him as a person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in the pre-machine age, the only way in which a man could accomplish work without doing it himself was to use, use an animal. Domestication of animals placed in his hands living tools, the intelligent use of which prepared the way for both agriculture and transportation. And without these animals, man could not have risen from his primitive estate to the levels of subsequent civilization. So it was the use of animals that advanced uh, early man along the way. Uh, really? Which of the animals best suited to domestication were found in Asia, especially in the central to southwest regions? It was one reason why civilization progressed faster in that locality than in other parts of the world. 
Many of these animals had been twice before domesticated, and in the endite age, they were retamed once again. But the dog had remained with the hunter ever since being adopted by the blue man long, long before. Remember that story? <laughs> the dog would follow the hunters back to, to get a little bite of meat. And so they got friendly with the hunters, and they followed the hunters around, and they started using the dogs to help find the animals. Rodney, would you take the next one? Cool. Ooh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's it's really cool. neat. Okay, the Andites of Kyrgyzstan were the first peoples to extensively domesticate a horse. And this is another reason why their culture was for so long predominant. By 5000 BC, the Mesopotamian, Turkestan, and Chinese farmers had begun the raising of sheep, goats, cows, camels, horses, fowls, and elephants. They employed as beasts of burden the ox, camel, horse, and yak. Man was himself at one time the beast of burden. One ruler of the blue race once had 100,000 men in his colony of burden birds. So they used yeah. human beings to, to carry things around. 100,000 men just to carry things. That's a lot of money. Look how we uh, controlled the world. Well, they were conquered. You know, these, these tribes would go in and conquer other tribes, and they would make them their slaves, and the slaves would become one of the uh, burden barriers, basically. You know, you had a choice, you either become a slave or die. You know, they kill you. And so, I guess being a slave... I think they control them by feeding them. That's right. Yeah. That's or right. not feeding them. Or not feeding them, either one, you yeah. know. The institutions of slavery and private ownership of land came from agriculture. Slavery raised the master standard of living and provided more leisure for social culture. By freeing him up, he could think about social issues and have more leisure time to, to dream about things. Yeah, think not the slaves. Not the slaves, but yeah. The savage is a slave to nature. But scientific civilization is slowly conferring increasing liberty on mankind. Though animal, through animals, fire, wind, water, electricity, and other undiscovered resources of energy, man has liberated and will continue to liberate himself from the necessity for unremitting toil. Regardless of the transient trouble produced by the prolific in invention of machinery, the ultimate benefit, benefits to be derived from such mechanical emissions are inestimable. Inestimable. There you go. Civilization can never flourish, much less be uh, established until man has leisure to think, to plan, to imagine new and better ways of doing things. He needs dreaming time, right? To dream up new ways of doing things. Yeah, you know, um, when I go up to my cabin, in a remote uh, forest, I mean, a long way away from civilization. It takes a incredible amount of time just to exist there from day to day, especially in the winter, having to get your water. Yeah. Um, but you know what? My, my food is coming. Uh, I've got fuel for the lot, for my lanterns. Um, I've got matches. I've got the cook stove, you know, um, I, I can find the leaves of time. Yeah. It, it's hard to find even now. So I can imagine back then, you spent all your time trying to live. That's yeah, hard. that's right. See this yeah, beautiful cat? Perfect. This beautiful cat came from the ASPCA. So y'all watching this at home, go to your local ASPCA and adopt a beautiful cat. Yeah. Okay. You can find cats just like this. Beautiful dogs too. Beautiful dogs too. This was a seven-year-old cat that they were having trouble adopting because he was older. And she just beautiful. She just as sweet as she can be. But she wants to be up here with her. She wants to be up here with her papa. Yeah. 
She's attached to her papa because we rescued her. Alright. Who's that? You do? Uh, huh? I don't know. Let's see. Go ahead, read. Okay. I thought you read it. It's Roger, the savage is the slave. Roger just read it? No, did I just read it? Yeah, I just did. That's right. Um, Yeah, I think we left out some parts. 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 Yeah, I think we yeah, man first. Okay, so I went I've, over. I've got it. There we go. Okay. And is this mine? Yes. Okay. Man first simply appropriated his shelter, lived under ledges or dwelt in caves. Next he adapted such natural materials as wood and stone to the creation of family huts. Lastly, he entered the creative stage of home building, learning to manufacture brick and other building materials. Interesting. Now, Millie, I think you're up for this one. Um, the peoples of the Turkestan Highlands were the first of the more modern races to build their homes of wood, houses not at all unlike the early log cabins of the American pioneer settlers. Throughout the plains, human dwellings were made of brick, later on of burned brick. Basically, what happened? What happened? A, a hut, hut caught on fire, and it baked the clay. So they figured out how to by, by baking the clay, it made it harder. Okay, and from that evolved burned brick. They started burning the clay and making bricks out of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Okay. I think it says. Here we go. This is the, the paragraph right here. Rodney, did you take this one? No. The old river races made for us by setting tall poles in the ground in a circle. The fox would then drop together, making a skeleton pole for the hut, which was the police to trans traverse reads. A whole creation to some way of beauty and very fast. The structure of the building dog, dog, over, with clay, and at the time in the sun, would make a very serviceable medicine of the place. So they put poles in the ground, they brought the tops together like a teepee, right? And then they took reeds and interwove them between the poles all the way around, okay? And after they dried out, they packed clay on top of it, and that made made it waterproof. It made a, a nice little home. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty smart. Yeah. And you didn't even have to finance it. You know, no high interest rate, right? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All of your life. That's right. It was from these early huts that the subsequent idea of all sorts of basket weaving independently originated. Among one group, the idea of making pottery arose from observing the effects of smearing these pole frameworks with moist clay. The practice of hardening pottery by baking was discovered when one of these clay-covered primitive huts accidentally burned. The arts of olden days were many times derived from the accidental occurrences attendant upon the daily life of early peoples. At least this was almost wholly true of the evolutionary progress of mankind up to the coming of Adam. So up till Adam, when Adam taught him how to make clay pots and that sort of thing, that's the way this was done. And inter another interesting thing we're going to find out in the slide, almost, or maybe the next one. Let's see, I'm not going to say anything because I think it's kind of... 
While pottery had first been introduced by the staff of the Prince about a half million years ago, the making of clay vessels had practically ceased over 150,000 years. Only the Gulf Coast pre-Sumerian Nautites continued to make clay vessels. The art of pottery making was revived during Adam's time. The dissemination of this art was simultaneous with the extension of the desert areas of Africa, Arabia, and Central Asia, and it spread in successive waves of improving technique over Mesopotamia, out over the Eastern Hemisphere. So, the prince's staff in Dalmatia, they taught them how to make clay pottery. Okay? They made it for 100,000 years, and then the art kind of went away. It died for 150,000 years, and then when uh, when Adam and Eve came, Adam and Eve retaught them how to make clay vessels again. That was 35,000 years ago, right? And so it went away, and then it came back again. So if we dig out and excavate in archaeology, there'll be a 150,000 year span where we will find clay, and then suddenly we won't for 150,000, and then we find clay pots again. Okay. So that's why they think clay pottery started seven or eight thousand years ago. Right. Uh, really. These civilizations of the Andite age cannot always be traced by the stages of their pottery or other arts. The smooth course of human evolution was tremendously complicated by the regimes of both Dalmatia and Eden. It often occurs that the latter vases and implements are inferior to the earlier products of the pure and by the people. So some of the older stuff was better made than the, the more recent ones, that's what you're saying. Because they were taught by the Dalmatians how to do it. And then they were taught by Adam and Eve how to do it. Right, so the later, after a, a few thousand years, they lose technique, and, and so it's not as good after that. All right. Uh, Rodney. Number three, cities, manufacture, and commerce. The climatic destruction of the rich, open grassland, hunting, and grazing grounds of Turkestan began about 12,000. BC, compelled the men of those regions to resort to new forms of industry and crude manufacturing. So, some came to the cultivation of domesticated crops. Others became agriculturists or collectors of water, corn, and food. But the higher type of handout intellects chose to engage in trade in manufacture. It even became the custom for entire tribes to dedicate themselves to the development of a single industry from the valley of the Nile to the Hindu coasts and from the Indus to the Yellow River. The chief business of superior tribes became the cultivation of the soil which commerce with commerce as a side goal. So they did commerce basically as a secondary thing, right? Because they grew on too. The increase in trade and in the manufacture of raw materials into various articles of commerce was directly instrumental in producing those early and semi-peaceful communities which were so influential in spreading the culture and the arts of civilization. Before the era of extensive world trade, Social communities were tribal, expanded family groups. Trade brought into fellowship different sorts of human beings, thus contributing to a more cross fertilization of culture. Because the merchants would travel from village to village or tribe to tribe, uh, that have exposure to different cultures, different religions, different uh, everything, pretty much. So uh, it, it spread civilization that much faster. About 12,000 years ago, the era of the independent city was dawning, and these primitive trading and manufacturing cities were always surrounded by zones of agriculture and cattle raising. 
Well, it is true that industry was promoted by the elevation of the standards of living. You should have no misconception regarding the refinements of early urban life. The early races were not overly neat and clean, and the average primitive community rose from one to two feet every 25 years as the result of the mere accumulation of dirt and trash. Ooh. Certain of these old cities also rose above the surrounding ground very quickly because of their unbaked mud huts were short-lived and it was a custom to build a new dwelling right on top of the ruins of the old. <laughs> so, think about this. Every 25 years, because of all the dirt and trash and stuff these people were living in, they just build up. And then when the, when the hut finally fell in, they just leave it where it is and build something new right on top of it. And they're finding they're this. Still and, doing that today. And they're still doing yeah. that today. And uh, over in uh, in uh, the Middle East, they're digging up areas that are just that describe just like this. They have city upon city upon city. It's not really a city, community upon community upon community on these hills because they basically built up over time. Pretty interesting. It doesn't sound like a very nice place to live, does it? Well, you look at it when they do these subdivisions and everything. I mean, they tear down whatever's there, if there's yeah. anything there, you know, and then rebuild it. So, yeah. you know, they don't bury it, but... Yeah. <laughs> All right, Millie, can you take the next one? The widespread use of metals was a feature of this era in the early industrial and trading cities. We have already found a bronze culture in Turkestan dating before 9000 BC. In the Andites, early learned to work in iron, gold, and copper as well. But conditions were very different away from the more advanced centers of civilization. There were no distinct periods such as the stone, bronze, or iron age. All three existed at the same time in different localities. Did y'all catch that? So there really was no Stone Age or Bronze Age or Iron Age because they, they intermingled. They all existed at the same time. It depends on the raw materials the people had to work with in the area they were in. Right? So the people that had metal tools lived in an area that there, there was mining available in that area to develop those type of tools. And those who had stone tools didn't have access to anything. So that's what they did to that. It's kind of interesting. All right. Uh, Rodney, would you take the next one, please? Gold was the first metal to be sought by men. It was easy to work, and at first was used only as an ornament. Copper was next employed, but not exclusively until it was mixed with tin to make the harder bronze. With the discovery of mixing copper and tin to make bronze was made by one of the Adamsonites Adamsonites of Turkestan, whose highland copper mine happened to be located alongside a tin deposit. This happened to be there, so they mixed them together. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Work with what you got, right? With the appearance of crude manufacturing beginning industry, commerce quickly became the most potent influence in the spread of cultural civilization. The opening up of the trade channels by land and by sea greatly facilitated travel and the mixing of cultures as well as the blending of civilizations. By 5000 BC, the horse was in general use throughout civilized and semi-civilized lands. These later races not only had the domesticated horses, horse, but also various sorts of wagons and chariots. Ages before, the wheel had been used, but now vehicles so equipped became universally employed both in commerce and war. It's amazing how war work will propagate Okay, the traveling trader and the roving explorer did more to advance historic civilization than all other influences combined. 
military conquest, colonization, and missionary enterprises fostered by the labor religions were also factors in the spread of culture. But these were all secondary to the trading relations, which were ever acceler accelerated by the rapidly developing arts and sciences of the industry. Think about today. Why do we have so much peace among so many nations? It's a lot, lot to do because of the internet. We trade for goods over the internet. We order stuff from China, Asia, uh, the Middle East, uh, England, Australia. You know, we basically, because of the internet, are interchanging money and goods across the whole world, right? And this creates more friendly relations with those those uh, countries. And capital. Yeah, you know, and capital. It, it's and it's those things that's going to make the whole world settled in light and life come that much quicker. Because to have peaceful relate to, to trade like this, we need peaceful relationships with those nations, or regardless of what the politicians do, right? Because the people demand that. Yeah. Uh, would you take the next one, Rodney? No, no, no. Rodney, if you yeah, just read. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I just, you just read, right? So this one's mine. Okay. In, infusion of the Adamic stock into the human race has not only quickened the pace of civilization, but also greatly stimulated their proclivities toward adventure and exploration. To the end of the most of Eurasia and northern Africa was presently occupied by the rapidly multiplying mixed descendants of the Andites. Part of this is why everyone thinks that civilization came from northern Africa, but it did. Okay, it was the mixing of this, these races that uh, basically caused this misconstrued idea. All right. Millie, would you take the next one, the mixed races? Number four, the mixed races. As contact is made with the dawn of historic times, all of Eurasia, northern, north, northern Africa, and the Pacific Islands is overspread with the composite races of mankind. And these races of today have resulted from a blending and reblending of the five basic human stocks of the watch. Okay, we're going to talk about those. Rodney? Five basic stocks. Each of the hereditary races was identified by certain distinguishing physical characteristics. Hermitites were long headed. Pendermites were broad hair. The Sadic races were medium hair. The yellow and blue men tended to be broad headed men. The blue races were met with the Pendermite stock for the psychically broad hair. The second day singers were medium to long hair. <laughs> okay, think about this. When you see. That's a strange way to describe it. It is, but you think about the, the carvings from Samaria, the Sumerian kings, and the um, carvings on the, the walls of the pyramids and stuff. You notice how all those people are what? Long headed, right? This is what they're talking about not broad-headed. The Andonic races, the ones that came uh, from Andon and Fonta, you know, not the Adamites or the Nodites, but the Andon races were broad-headed. Remember some early, uh, the early Andonic stock mixed, some of them mixed with the Gibeons, the, the apes basically, okay? So that's probably why they maintained their broad-headedness like the apes, okay? The Adamites and the Nodites. The Nodites are the descendants of the Dalmatia 100, right? And the Adamites are the descendants of Adam and Eve, okay? They were long-headed too, all right? 
So those are the ones that ended up settling, the Nodites settled around Samaria. That's why you see all these Samarian kings with long heads. All right? The same way with the Nile Valley. So that's why you see the Egyptians with the long head. Right? Does this make sense? They're all coming together? Uh, the Sangic races, the medium head and the uh, broad headed, um, yeah, were basically the red, yellow, and blue men, right? The, those races. So they were shorter and stockier and had the broader head or the medium sized head than, than the other, other races. So that's why they came out the way they were. Now let's go to the next paragraph because it continues on to some of this. All right. Although these skull dimensions are serviceable in deciphering racial origins, the skeleton as a whole is far more dependable. In the early development of the Arantia races, there were originally five distinct types of skeletal structure. One, and endonic, Arantia, Aborigines. Aborigines. Let's stop there before you go on. Okay. Endonic. Who are, who are those? Endon and Fon. Right? That's the Andonic race. They, those were the original people of the world, the Aborigines, Rancho Aborigines. Okay, go on. Two, primary Sangit, the red, yellow, and blue. Three, secondary Sangit, orange, green, and indigo. Okay, all these races came from what? One family. They were all Sangit races, but they are the different hues of human beings. The red, yellow, blue, and the orange, green, and indigo. Right? That's all from the same, same, same family. Okay? Go on. Four Nodites. Nodites. Nodites, descendants of the Dalmatians. We know the Dalmatians were the, were the first, the Caligasta 100, right? Sixty of them left and rebelled, and that's the base of the Nodite race, right? They followed Nod into the area which Nat was called the land of and five, and and Adamites. Adamites. Adamites, the violent race. Violent the race. Not the, violent, violent. And those were the descendants of Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. right? And they tried to spread the violent red blood to all the races to bring them all up. Okay, so that's the basic five primary or uh, skeletons. Yeah, mm -hmm. races, right. Who were the parents of that, that actually gave birth to um, to all these different races? It doesn't matter. They them. were a, a Sangic pair. But they a didn't mother say and father. They were descendants from uh, Andon and Fonta. I know, but it doesn't offshoot. say their names or anything. Huh? It doesn't say their name, give their names in the book or anything. No. I would think that'd be really important to have that many children. Well, they wouldn't. They would. People would try to revere them if they did that. That's what it would. Yeah, really was. Okay. As these five great racial groups extensively intermingled, continually mixture that tended to obscure the Andonite type by Sangic inheritance dominance. The Sangic, Sangic were the dominant race. The Laps and the Eskimos are blends of Andonite and none of them that in Sangic blue races, the Sangic races, right? So Basically, the Eskimos, which basically look the same as they did 500,000 years ago, okay? Their skeletal structures come the nearest to reserving their aboriginal and Donic type. But the Adamites and the Nodites have become so admixed with the other races that they can be de detected only by a generalized Caucasoid order. What are they talking about Caucasoid order? Those are the Caucasian races, basically. So the uh, the Adamites and the Nodites were the base for the ca Caucasian races, or the mixtures of the Caucasian races as they mixed with the other colors. Okay. So there is no such thing as a pure white race, is there? Is the blood different in any of these people? I mean, no. it's all the same? The no, the only blood difference they ever mention is the violet blood. I say only um, Okay. What's a um, interesting 
It's the, the no. blending of all the uh, Caucasian races, basically, all of them. Yeah, nobody's white anymore. I've never nobody's seen really white, white anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you look at the people from Russia, they're Caucasoid, okay? Yeah, yeah most of them are Caucasoid races. Uh, the people in America are Caucasoid. They all came from Europe, right? Most of them, from England, France, Spain. Sweden, all those things, because it's, it's so intermixed now. You can't, you can't. There's no pure white race by any stretch of the imagination. You have to be an albino. You have to be yeah, an albino. Yeah, an albino is really white. Yeah, yeah and an albino is not a race. It's, no, it's not. It's the uh, genetic mm -hmm. uh, change. And that can be in any race. That, that can be in any race. That's right. All right, uh, Millie, I think you're up. Turn your mic back on, Millie. In general, therefore, as the human remains of the last 20,000 years are unearthed, it will be impossible clearly to distinguish the five original types, five original types. Study of each skeletal structures will disclose that mankind is now divided into approximately three classes. <laughs> Just three? Yep, just three. Uh, Rodney, would you take the first one? Uh, yeah, number one, the Caucasus group. The Nodai and the Gun Scots, further modified by primary and solemn secretary singer, excuse me, the mixture, and by considerable and donic. The Occidental white races, together with some Indian and Turanian peoples, are included in this group. The unifying factor in this division is the greater or lesser proportion of anti-inheritance. Okay, and that's, that includes all the Asianic people like the yellow race and uh, Indian the people from India also, uh, Americas, Euro a lot of Europe, and a lot of uh, Australia, right? Okay, and then the next one is... The uh, Mon Monroy Chief. Did you switch yours? Oh, sorry. The primary Sangat type, including the original red, yellow, and blue races, the Chinese and Amarons belong to this group. In Europe, the Mongoloid type has been modified by secondary Sangat and Adonic mixture, still more by Andite infusion. The Malayan and other Indonesian peoples are included in this classification, though they contain a high percentage of secondary Sangat blood. Okay, remember the, Sang the primary Sangats were red, yellow, and blue. Uh, this is what they're talking about. The Mongoloids are the primary Sangat types. Okay. And remember when Genghis Khan conquered the world, he was considered a Mongoloid. Mm -hmm. Remember that? So they mixed with everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. They have very broad faces and very small eyes. Well, yeah, that's right. And then finally the Negroid, the secondary Sangat type, which originally included the orange, green, and the indigo race. Now, when they say the indigo race, they're talking about all shades uh, of uh, black, right? What we consider the black race. The light brown black men all the way to the very dark black men, okay? And these are the mixture of the um, orange green and the original indigo race, right? So this is the type best illustrated by the Negro. And it will be found through Africa, India, and Indonesia, whenever, wherever the secondary Sangit race is located. Okay. There's also a lot of the uh, uh, Negroid or Negro race in uh, some parts of India, also, right? Yeah, I have a problem with how they call the Negro black man yeah. because most black men and women are actually brown. They are different shades of yeah, I mean, brown, not, from very light brown to Nigerian very dark. Nigerian or, or black. Yeah. 
you yeah. know, more so than... Very few are very, very, very black. Very yeah, very few. Yeah. Just certain areas, like in the, in the in, you mm -hmm. know, in Nigeria, I mean, I know that the women in there are very yeah. dark. But, uh, I had a, a database uh, teacher when I was studying uh, Oracle uh, that was from uh, Guyana, and he was very, very black. black. Yeah. Very, very black. Yeah. Um, smartest database man ever but anyway, uh, it just depends on the area you come from and the mixture you got. You know, yeah, but so few mixture. black people here in the United States, since they did come from Africa, supposedly, I guess it's through the intermixing too. Uh, but they really are just, when you look at a black person, it's really not a black person, it's a brown person. If you yeah. go by skin, if you yeah. go by that. You know. yeah. There were quite a few really, really black skinned people mm -hmm. in Italy when we were there in really? Southern Italy. Yeah. Here in Naples, yes, extremely black, uh, smooth, shiny black skin. Yeah. Yeah. Much so yeah. that the Italians call them melanzani, which is the Italian name for eggplant. Eggplant, what's your problem? Smooth, shiny yeah. black skin. Beautiful, beautiful, yeah. beautiful people. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, really being around, you know, uh, like an office with more uh, black people, it's so interesting because when a Cockanoid, 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 comes in, when a white person comes in, Cockazoid. Cockazoid. Yeah. I sound, I sound like uh, It's amazing because the white people look so pale and, you know, yeah. I think the closest thing we've seen to white, white people were from England. Uh, when, you know, yeah, yeah. in areas where there's not yeah, a lot of sun. There's some in China, China also. There yeah, are there's some in China that's also. Like Chinese. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Millie, would you take the cross? Yeah, Where are we going? We're on number five? In North no, China. No, the last paragraph of the book. Okay, got it. In North China, there is a certain blending of Caucasoid and Mongoloid types. In the Levant, and the Caucasoid and Negroid have intermingled. In India, as in South America, all three types are represented. All three types are represented? Hmm. And the skeletal characteristics of the three surviving types still persist and help to identify the later ancestor of the present day human race. So you can take a skeleton of, that they dig up from anybody and you can pretty much tell what race they were from the skeleton. Well, yeah, it's more than color. Yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. It, there's a yeah. whole lot more than color that makes up. Who, uh, what a that glorious <laughs> That's okay, because I think I'm going to stop on five, uh, for the night and take it up from five for the next time. That's about half the way. Is that okay with everyone? That's beautiful. Thank you. No, yeah, we'll start on cultural society next time. Okay? Mm -hmm. It looks like, uh, I don't think I can. There it is. <laughs> okay. cultural, so we'll start here next time. Let's say a little prayer and we'll, we'll put it for the night. Um, time to it. Dearest Father God, Mother God, thank you so, so much for this opportunity to come together and to share the wisdom and the knowledge that you have given to us through the, the ranch of love. We thank you for bringing us over for us. And we're grateful that we are part of this period of time so that we can have the exposure to answer the question that you're so long for the rest of our lives. We thank you for the lesson tonight, and thank you for helping us to, to learn more and to grow more and to take this knowledge and spread it and give it to others and share um, um, the wisdom and, um, and hopes that, that we may continue to grow and we will continue to grow and we will to learn more. It is in your name, Jesus Christ, my God. Thank you for joining us at home. Please come see us again. We'll take it to the next half next week.